Hi, this is Vanessa Gorman. I'm a classicist and a professor of history at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. In this short series of videos, I want to lay down the basics of dependency grammar because before you can talk about Greek grammar, you need to know your terms in English and you need to understand them well. Much of Greek grammar resembles English grammar. The verbs are different pr primarily, but you can't begin to talk about grammar or syntax as we call it unless you know how to talk about it in English first. You can't just emote your way through a sentence as far as I'm concerned. You just wind up with refrigerator magnet translations that make no sense. So we use a system called dependency grammar or dependency syntax. Um, in this system, the verb is always the structural center of the clause. First thing you look for is where's my verb? Where's my verb? Um, all the linguistic units are directly connected only once in the whole structure of the sentence so that if you analyze these sentences in what we call trees you get just that a, what looks like a genealogical tree or something right you get you get a one verb or one word at the very top a verb or a coordinator and then you work your way down into more and more subordinated elements it's very simple and straightforward it's very easy to use very easy to learn it's especially good if there's free word order in the language as in Latin and Greek. Um, it's very easy to use a, a sentence that is analyzed already to feel your way through a sentence that you don't understand. And so you can use the analysis done by someone else to help you out. And in contrast, the, the competing grammar or syntax called constituency grammar made famous by Chomsky is really hard to learn, really complex. I think of it as essentially the opposite of Occam's razor. He unduly complicates everything. And it really doesn't work well if your word order isn't fixed. So you can see here, words get repeated over and over again. And this is a very, very simple sentence. Um, in a harder sentence, you see it gets even more complicated. Um, I don't like this representation in English that well, but it's what I could find. Um, to give you an example in Greek, a tree of a sentence from Xenophon, very straightforward. The whole sentence relies on the main verb. It, the main verb of the sentence is the highest unit, the predicate. Its object happens to be a that clause. They, they reason that. Um, so this is the object, but this itself is another main verb of the clause this time, a subject, an object. It's very straightforward, it's easy to use, it's easy to learn. So this is how I'm gonna approach this. I've done more Greek trees than anyone else on earth. And I'm very, very familiar with this. This um, program is called Arethusa. It's, it's on the Perseids platform at Tufts University, open to anyone to use. Um, and I'm gonna make a lot of use of this as we learn how to read Greek. So let's begin at the beginning. Like I say, I want to go through the language of, of syntax. Um, parts of a sentence, the sentence itself is the textual unit that is independent. That's the one required part of a sentence. In Greek, the only thing you need really is a verb um, because the verb will contain the subject as well. And we call the main verb of the sentence a predicate. So I just made up a sentence here to give you some examples. Um, Maggie decided to run for political office someday is your main clause, your, your independent clause. Decided is your main verb. The clause before it, beginning with when, is a temporal clause. Tells you what time something happened. The clause after it is a causal clause. Neither of them make sentences by themselves. They rely on the main verb of the whole sentence to be a, a grammatical unit. So let's begin with this simple sentence from the early in the Hellenica of Xenophon. You're going to see this an awful lot in these lessons. I'm going to keep coming back to this passage. So what I want you to do is pause the video for a minute and identify all the main verbs, the verbs of the independent clauses in the sentence, the ones that have to be there. And then pick it up and we'll, we'll discuss them in the next slide. All right. So. You should have come 
to these five verbs. Tisafernes came is the main verb of the first sentence. Tisafernes seized and imprisoned gives you the main verbs of the second sentence. Alcibiades and Mentithius provided and made are the main verbs of the third sentence. So that's what a main verb is. Now, if I return to my first sample sentence, what about a clause? Well, a clause is any unit of the sentence that contains a verb. Um, I want to say a conjugated verb. Um, Greek is a little bit more slippery than English, but we'll see that when we get to it. So in this case, for example, you have independent clauses, the main sentence, right, which would be everything from Maggie to someday. That is the unit that must be there. Now you could take out elements of it, but this is the unit as it's presented. You can coordinate clauses with an and, an or, a yet, a but, any word that makes the things on either side of it, the units on either side of it, coordinated. They have to be parallel. They have to be equal in status. So in this case, making a difference and wanting to make her mother proud are both on the same level, and therefore these are coordinated clauses. However, they're not the main clause of the sentence, are they? They are subordinate. These are clauses like when, like because, like since, like as a result. Um, like so that. Um, lots and lots of different subordinate clauses, like who, um, the woman who ran for office, uh, a relative clause. So there's lots of subordinate clauses that are dependent upon the main clause. So let's see if you've got these ideas straight. So let's give you some examples. Back to our sentence. First, pause the video again and identify all of the independent clauses in this sense. There should be one for each sentence, one or more for each sentence, I should say. So this is what you should have come up with. Tissaphernes came to the Hellespont is the main clause of the first sentence. Tissaphernes seized him and imprisoned him in Sardis is the second. Thirty days later, however, Alcibiades and Mentithius provided themselves with horses and made their escape from Sardis by night to Clazomenae. We have subordinate clauses littered before, in the middle, or after. So you can see they can come in any order. So how about the coordinate clauses? What in here is coordinated verbs? All right, so Tissaphernes seized him and imprisoned him. Alcibiades and Mantithius provided themselves with horses and made their escape from Sardis. Now we have a third and here, Alcibiades and Mantithius. It's not coordinating clauses, however, it's coordinating words, Alcibiades and Mantithius. It's making a noun clause, if you will, or sorry, a noun phrase. A phrase is the next unit we're going to talk about. It's the next smallest unit, but it doesn't join two verbs, so it is not a coordinated clause. It's not coordinating clauses. All right, finally, let's identify all the subordinate clauses. After this happened, a temporal clause. When Alcibiades went, again, a, a temporal clause. Who had been taken prisoner? A, a, a relative clause. It's explaining who, these, who this person is, Mantithius. Good, all right, well, hopefully you got this results. Um, going back to our sentence, the next smallest unit in a sentence is a phrase, which is any group of grammatically related words. So Alcibiades and Mentithius was a noun phrase. For political office is a prepositional phrase. Decided to run is a verb phrase. Wanted to make is a verb phrase. Her mother, political office, a noun phrase. So this is any group of related words. And of course, the smallest unit is a word, the smallest element that can be uttered in isolation and still have meaning. We can contract words. We can even what we call allied words. But we, you know, this is the smallest we get. Now, having come this far, words are what we're going to be talking about first of all. And words begin as parts of speech. Words are in a sentence. When you're analyzing a sentence in dependency syntax, words are going to have kind of two labels. One is going to be the part of speech tag, 
We call it the post tag, P-O-S tag. The other is going to be its relationship to whatever word it hangs on in the sentence, whatever its parent is. So I'm going to be talking about relations and I'm going to be talking about parts of speech and make sure you understand that these are two different things. The part of speech is the category of words that people have, uh, have decided have similar grammatical properties. Okay, now the best way to explain it, as in many grammatical terms, grammatical terms are very, very hard to explain and they often are in the category of I know it when I see it, but even linguists can't define things in a way that makes people happy. Um, in Greek, the possible parts of speech if you look at any grammar book, are pretty limited. We essentially have nine things. Nouns, adjectives, articles. Now, articles are technically a subcategory of adjectives, but in Greek, we tend to pull them out separately. As, as Articles are, frankly, your best friend in the world in Greek. Um, pronouns, verbs, adverbs, prepositions, or what we call adpositions, meaning Sometimes the preposition can occur before its object and sometimes afterwards. So more technically, it's called an adposition. Um, conjunctions can be coordinators like and and or, or they can be subordinators like when and after and because. And then finally, interjections. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all of these parts of speech for Greek very carefully, and I'm going to explain them. And that's essentially what we're going to do in this series of videos and we're going to talk about how they work in Greek, right? So the part of speech is sort of its function in a vacuum, what it usually does. But parts of speech vary between languages. Almost every language has a noun and a verb, but there are very, there's great complexity within languages. Part of speech is what you'll see if you look something up in a lexicon, a dictionary. Um, some words will have multiple parts of speech. You can say, next, they went to the bank, in which case the word next is an adverb. Or you can say, next to the bank, they saw a dog chasing a squirrel, in which case next to the bank is a prepositional phrase, and so next is a preposition. Um, if you see the parts of speech and the relations possible in Greek. These are all things we're going to explain as we get to them. Some of them are pretty obvious. Subject. So a noun can be the subject of a sentence or it could be the object. Sorry, I should say a subject of a verb or the object of a verb. It can be um, the complementary object, which we'll explain, and, or the predicate nominative. An adjective can be an attribute or these other interesting little attributes. Um, the predicate is the main verb of the sentence. You can also have auxiliary verbs, pretty rare in Greek. The only thing you see in common are adverbs. Okay, adverb, adverb. That's the one confusing thing. Everything else is pretty straightforward. Possibly you could say conjunction is a little confusing, but not if you think of it in terms of it can be a subordinating or it can be a coordinating. If it is coordinating, we call it a conjunction. If it is subordinating, like after or since or because, we label it as an auxiliary C or an AUX C. Um, so just keep these in mind. We're going to be getting used to these terms, getting used to seeing them, getting used to talking about them. And I'm going to go through all of the parts of speech in turn, remembering that prepositional phrases for example, can do a lot of things. What is labeled one way as a part of speech. So on is a preposition. On the table is a prepositional phrase by part of speech, but it can do multiple things in the sentence. Now, people kind of expect that a preposition is adverbial. He was standing on the table to adjust the light. So it's, it's modifying the standing, right? But you can also say the book on the table is mine, but the book on the bookcase is from the library, in which case, on the table is defining the book, it's modifying the book, it's acting as an adjective. Likewise, put the book on the table means it's completing the meaning of the verb. It's a necessary argument of the verb. I can't just say put the book, right? It implies you're putting it somewhere. And so therefore, 
in this case, you would label this as an object. So this is why I say part of speech is one thing. Relation in the sentence is something else. Now, Greek is an inflected language. That means you change its forms depending on its function. English is slightly inflected, not very much. Um, there are very few bits and pieces of English that are still really inflected. Mostly it's the idea of singular and plural tend to be different. Possessives are indicated by the forms, but there really aren't that many things be beyond plurals and possessives that are inflected in English. There are a few very common words. So for example, I, my, me, we, our, us, right? His, her, their. Um, what we call the personal pronoun is still inflected in English. Um, very few verbs are seriously inflected. Um, usually, again, it's just singular and plural. We have some difference. I am, you are, right? So there are a few things that, that vary, um, that have uh, different what we call morphology. So morphology is how you change the form depending on the meaning. This, this is the changes from I am to you are. So morphology identifies the form of the sentence. It's literally the study of shapes. Um, we'll give you paradigms, which are examples of different patterns. So I am, you are, he, she, it is, we are, you are, they are, is the paradigm of the present indicative active of the verb to be. Gives you the all of the, the possible forms. Um, nouns and adjectives change their form by declining. That's just the way we call it. We talk about noun declensions and they decline. Whereas verbs are, are given in conjugations and so verbs conjugate. So whenever I say a noun is conjugating or a verb is declining, it's because I'm losing my mind. So um, nouns and adjectives decline, verbs conjugate. And we'll talk about what all these things mean when we get further along. So this lays down the very basic background. And next, we're going to go into the very par parts of speech themselves and go through them fairly carefully. As you will see, the English explanations of the morphology and the relations of various Greek terms.